My name is Dane Menke. I am the Digital Marketing Manager here at Regenesis and Land Science. Before we get started, I have just a few administrative items to cover. Since we're trying to keep this under an hour, today's presentation will be conducted with the audience audio settings on mute. This will minimize unwanted background noise from the large number of participants joining us today. If the webinar or audio quality degrades, please try refreshing your browser. If that does not fix the issue, please disconnect and repeat the original login steps to rejoin the webcast. If you have a question, we encourage you to ask it using the question feature located on the webinar panel. We'll collect your questions and do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation. If we don't address your question within the time permitting, we'll make an effort to follow up with you after the webinar. We are recording this webinar and a link to the recording will be emailed to you once it is available. In order to continue to sponsor events that are of value and worthy of your time, we will be sending out a brief survey following the webinar to get your feedback. Today's presentation will discuss using forensics to identify PFAS sources. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. We are pleased to have with us Elizabeth Denley, PFAS Initiative Leader and Chemistry Director at TRC. As a project QA chemist at TRC, Elizabeth Denley is responsible for providing quality assurance oversight in support of environmental investigation, including remediation programs, ambient air monitoring, and human health and ecological risk assessments. She's currently serving on the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council, or ITRC, PFAS team, is a co-leader on the PFAS Naming Convention sub-team, and won the 2017 ITRC Industry Affiliates Award for her contributions to this team. She currently works on many different types of PFAS investigations with a specific focus on chemistry, sampling procedures, data interpretation, forensics, QAQC, and analytical methodologies. We're also pleased to have with us today Maureen Dooley, Vice President Industrial Sector at Regenesis. Maureen has over 25 years of experience in many aspects of the remediation industry, including project management, research and development, senior technical oversight, remedial design, and laboratory management. Her prior experience includes work to evaluate the biodegradation of a wide range of chemical constituents that include chlorinated solvents, petroleum hydrocarbons, explosives, aromatic hydrocarbons, and pesticides. In her current role at Regenesis, she provides technical leadership for complex soil and groundwater remediation projects, including PFAS groundwater contamination treatment throughout North America, as well as remediation design, strategy, and business development in the Northeastern US and Eastern Canada. All right, that concludes our introduction. So now I will hand things off to Elizabeth Denley to get us started. Thank you. So I just want to say thank you to Regenesis for allowing me to present today. And today I'm going to spend most of my time on technical aspects of PFAS forensics and some tools available to help you with source identification. I don't really have enough time to share everything I'd like to, but I'm going to give you a snapshot of a few different tools or concepts that you need to think about in your forensics evaluations. Okay, so you know we know PFAS are complicated. There's challenges with how PFAS cycles through the environment. The basis of toxicology and the regulations are all over the place. We still don't have a final multi-lab validated standard EPA analytical methodology yet for non-drinking water matrices. And we do have limited options for treatment of PFAS. And the public perception is really driving a lot of the action that we are seeing. But one of the major challenges of PFAS is that it's costing a lot of money to investigate and clean up. And who is ultimately going to pay for this? Is it going to be the municipalities, the manufacturers of PFAS, the users of PFAS? And I won't really discuss that specifically today, but in this determination of who will pay, forensics may come into play and that will be the focus of my talk today. So understanding the potential sources of PFAS out there is important for our forensics evaluations and site characterizations. There's many different industries or products where PFAS are used. And this information will be useful when you're considering what types of sites might have PFAS contamination or from where the contamination might originate. And it will be an important part of your forensics analysis. So forensics is not just about chemistry, but also about looking into operational history, potential nearby sites or sources that may be affecting your site. So PFAS are just about everywhere. So we need to use some of the specific source information when we're trying to differentiate PFAS at our sites. And this table is really just a very brief summary. And it's an example, but something you could use to start your analysis. Okay, so let's begin discussing some of the technical concepts in PFAS forensics. 
So to start, uh, TRC has developed and effectively used a PFAS forensics tool for source identification and differentiation. And the larger pie chart that you see on the screen here contains select PFAS analytes. So in my presentation today, we're going to be using these compounds as the focus of discussion. So you can see about half the pie chart on the left-hand side here covers what we call the perfluorocarboxylic acids, PFCAs, in a blue shade. So compounds like PFOA, PFNA. About half the pie chart on the right side covers the perfluorosulfonic acids in the yellow, oranges, and reds. So compounds like PFOS, perfluorobutane sulfonic acid. And there's also a couple of precursors. So I included telomers, 5,3-fluorotelomer carboxylic acid, 6,2-fluorotelomer sulfonate in these darker colors. And these are examples of the many precursor compounds that can break down and be transformed into the terminal perfluorocarboxylic acids and perfluorosulfonic acids. So throughout most of my slides, the color code will remain the same for these constituents. So I know this is not really easy to see, but this slide gives you a very big picture summary of some of the different signatures that we may see that can reflect different sources. So at the top of this slide, you can see a lot of the red, orange. These are the perfluorosulfonic acids. So the red is PFOS. The yellow is perfluorohexane sulfonic acid. And you look at these signatures, and it's probably most likely from an aqueous film forming foam source, AFFF, the firefighting foam. And towards the bottom, you see maybe a plastic source with more of the blue perfluorocarboxylic acid, specifically um, PFOA. But this slide also gives you the big picture summary of some of the different signatures that we can see, which can reflect different fate and transport scenarios also. So these types of chemical signatures can be used to identify various characteristics, and not just of sources, but also characteristics of different fate and transport scenarios. So we may see the breakdown of certain PFAS precursor compounds, like those fluorotelomers, further downstream in a plume. And we can show a plume becoming more enriched in something else because of the breakdown of those precursors. There could also very well be a change in signatures due to commingling of more than one so source, causing differences in pie charts along the length of a plume. So it's critical to understand all potential sources along a PFAS plume. So the chemical signatures are a really good starting point in providing information on different sources and different fate and transport scenarios, but they are, are just a starting point because with PFAS, as we know, there's a lot going on. So I'm not gonna really spend a lot of time on this slide today, but I, I presented it here because we're just, you know, we're beginning to understand more and more when there are certain PFAS chemicals that are more indicative of a particular product or industry. And some of that is highlighted here as examples for your reference. I wanna spend a little bit of time today on AFFF, the firefighting foam, and show you some examples of how these signatures can be helpful because as most of us know, AFFF is one of the major sources of PFAS contamination. And more often or not, you're going to be dealing with AFFF on a PFAS site. So let me just start with a general overview. And in general, there's three categories of AFFF. So first, there's the legacy first generation AFFF. And most of these were PFOS based phones sold under the brand name 3M Lightwater. And all those sales of this type of foam ended in 2002. Many locations may still contain this in their inventory. So these foams will typically contain PFOS, perfluorohexane sulfonic acid, and possibly even PFOA. Second, we have the legacy second generation AFFF. And these were sold from about the 1970s to 2016. And these foams are fluorotelomer based. And these foams contain long chain fluorotelomers, most likely 8,2 fluorotelomer sulfonate mixed with 6,2 fluorotelomer sulfonate. But it is the longer chain 8,2 fluorotelomer sulfonate that we're concerned about because this fluorotelomer can break down to PFOA. And third is the modern fluorotelomer AFFF. So most foam manufacturers have now transitioned to the use of only short chain fluorotelomers. So the 6,2 fluorotelomer sulfonate. So these foams do not contain or break down in the environment to PFOS or PFOA. 
Now, these foams may contain trace quantities of PFOA as a byproduct of the manufacturing process, but PFOA is not an ingredient of these foams. So, due to the production methods, the variability in AFFF formulations through the years, AFFF can really contain complex mixtures of PFAS. But understanding just some of the basics can help us start to differentiate these different types of AFFF. And this will be important for your forensics analysis. So here is a simplistic look at the different AFFF signatures. So the first one here is the first generation legacy, the PFOS-based AFFF. Again, also contains a good percentage of perfluorohexane sulfonic acid, the C6. And actually, it's important to note that different lots of AFFF produced by 3M had different ratios of PFOS to perfluorohexane sulfonic acid. The second one here is a second generation AFFF, and this one has equal amounts of the 6,2 and 8,2 fluorotelomer sulfonate. It's also a little PFOA here, which was likely from the breakdown of the 8,2 fluorotelomer sulfonate. And the last one is the modern fluorotelomer AFFF. So the one most foam manufacturers have switched over to, with the major component being 6,2 fluor uh, fluorotelomer sulfonate. So again, this is just a very simple view of the different AFFF signatures. So I wanted to show you this. This is a catch basin sample. It's from a Teflon coated fiberglass manufacturer. And it has an obvious signature. It's very distinct, right, from the AFFF signatures that we just looked at. And it's just, again, an example of the uniqueness of signatures in the manufacturing industry versus AFFF. So this signature is from an article showing 5,3 fluorotelomer carboxylic acid is dominant in landfill leachate. And the article says it's coming from carpeting. So it's a very unique signature. 5-3-fluorotelomer um, carboxylic acid, though, may have different sources. So this one article does say that it could be coming from the carpeting. There's other articles out there that say it can be a breakdown of one of the fluorotelomer alcohols. And, you know, and sources to landfills can be a mixture of different ingredients to begin with. So it is complicated, and I do warn people that it can be easy to be misled by the presence of 5-3-fluorotelomer carboxylic acid. But again, you can see a very different signature here than the AFFF signatures. Okay, so now we're going to add a different dimension to the forensics interpretations. So generating pie charts based on a regular PFAS analysis of individual PFAS compounds is step one. But then we need to look at how some of the very unique PFAS fate and transport concepts can also play a role in the forensics interpretations. So I wanna spend time today on a few uh, of the unique concepts, but there are more as well. So first, let's look at PFAS transformation. So there are thousands of precursor PFAS compounds that we do not measure in a standard PFAS analysis, but these precursor PFAS compounds can transform or break down into the more persistent PFAS chemicals that we do analyze for, like PFOA and PFOS and others. So the signatures, of surface water or groundwater from a release containing precursor PFAS, and some examples are here, like the 6,2 or 8,2 fluorotelomer sulfonate. The signatures may instead show a higher prevalence of the 6,2 or 8,2 fluorotelomer sulfonate transformation products. So the precursor PFAS, like the 8,2 and 6,2 fluorotelomer sulfonate, like we just talked about in the AFFF, they will degrade into more soluble and more mobile compounds, and again, into the more persistent compounds, like PFOA, perfluorobutanoic acid, and others. So you can see the rules of thumb here on the right for the transformation of these fluorotelomer sulfonates. So if you detected PFOA associated with an AFFF release, it's probably most likely from the use of the longer chain fluorotelomer-based foam, that second generation foam, the A2 fluorotelomer sulfonate. So one tool that we have is called a top assay analysis. So the top assay takes our sample and it does a very strong oxidation of it to break down any of those precursor compounds. The top assay will not break down the persistent compounds like PFOA and PFOS. It will only break down the precursors. 
So in essence, the top assay accelerates the natural rate of transformation. It could be a more realistic estimate of potential environmental liability than the typical PFAS analysis, especially if a fluorotelomer-based AFFF was released or was the residual source. So you can see the pie chart here with the results. So this is the original sample before the oxidation. So if you look at the top of the slide here, after the top assay oxidation, you, the sample was again, it was analyzed again for the regular list of PFAS. And after the oxidation, the total PFAS concentration increased by over an order of magnitude, about a million nanograms per liter. Now, if we look at the bottom part of the slide, you can see the 6,2 fluorotelomer sulfonate, which is again, a precursor PFAS was oxidized because it reduced in concentration. It went from 40,000 nanograms per liter to 1,000 nanograms per liter. While many of the perfluorocarboxylic acids, so this, the light blue and the white here on the pie chart, increased in concentration. So we're seeing here a dramatic increase in concentrations for the C4, C5, and C7 perfluorocarboxylic acids. These are the same compounds that are shown as transformation products in our rules of thumb box here for 6,2 fluorotelomer sulfonate. So we can use top assay to help us determine the ultimate source of the AFFF because of these PFAS transformation properties. It's very important to think about PFAS transformation during your forensics analysis. So what are some specific examples of how top assay results can help us understand PFAS transformations of AFFF in a forensics investigation? So there's a few tips here that could be used in conjunction with other information. So again, you need to look at the rules of thumb first for the transformation of the 6,2 and 8,2 fluorotelomer sulfonate, AFFF. And then you wanna look at some ratios of the breakdown products. And also you wanna look at which breakdown products are or are not present. And you can start to figure out the AFFF source. So I'm not gonna read these, but they can be helpful when you're looking at scenarios where the potential for more than one AFFF source exists something that's been very helpful for us um, at airport sites. Okay, so now let's discuss another unique PFAS fate and transport concept that can also play a role in forensics interpretations. So here the issue is chemical sorption of specific PFAS to organic materials or solids. So it's really important to understand for forensics because the sorption property can have a significant effect on the chemical signatures produced, and it can also significantly affect the concentrations of PFAS in a sample. So the longer chain PFAS compounds, so C8 and higher, and especially the perfluorosulfonic acids, so compounds like PFOS, can have higher absorption to solids. So how can this affect forensics? So let's look at the pie charts here. This is an example of groundwater that was sampled from a temporary well compared to the same groundwater sampled from a two inch well that was properly developed. You can see the turbid water has a much different composition than the clearer water with higher concentrations of the six carbon perfluorosulfonic acid and the eight carbon PFOA. And again, we know the longer chain PFAS and even more so for the perfluorosulfonic acids adhere more to the solids. So depending on how that water was sampled, you know, either a temporary well or a permanent well, and how much particulates were actually present, it could affect your forensics interpretation and ultimately determination of liability. So sometimes we submit, you know, wastewater samples, surface water samples, groundwater samples to labs, and these samples may be turbid or they may contain elevated levels of particulates. And when our samples are turbid or they have elevated levels of particulates, as I said, it could affect your forensics interpretation and it will be dependent on what the lab did with the sample. So the point here is something many people are not aware, which there's a major inconsistency in the lab community on the handling of these aqueous samples with particulates for PFAS analysis. There is no consistent method and again, these particulates can significantly affect PFAS concentrations, and not only the concentrations, but also the PFAS signatures that we create. So the resulting concentrations of PFAS 
and the resulting fingerprint of PFAS is going to vary depending on how the lab handled the sample. So some of the potential differences from lab to lab are listed here for your reference, but it's very important to one, you know, work with the lab ahead of time to figure out what you want based on your project objective. And two, if you're receiving data that's already been generated, please you know, understand what the lab did and if particulates were an issue because this could affect your forensics interpretation. So question the data that you are receiving. This is just a really good slide I like to show just illustrating the persistence of PFAS. It's from the Cape Fear River, from the Camor site. The samples are upgrading of the site. And you can see the consistency of the, the signature, the scale is 10 miles. If you look at the pie chart here at mile four, towards the top, you have 126 nanograms per liter, 20 miles downstream, you see pretty much the same signature, very, very similar concentrations. So there's hardly any dilution or sorption, nothing much has changed, it's actually kind of amazing. This is also good evidence that there's not much absorption to soil going on here. Towards the bottom, you see maybe a little contribution from a downstream source, but the mass of that possible contribution is really not substantial. And the overall fingerprint doesn't really change. It's actually fairly insignificant compared to what was in the river. So as we know, the standard PFAS analyte list continues to change. Obviously, the more information we have on the composition, the better. The commercial labs right now, they can analyze for up to about 70, 75 different PFAS chemicals. But one of the problems is, is that the largest data set we currently have is from UCMR3, and that only includes six of the perfluoroalkyl acids. Now, in the next few years, with UCMR5 happening, we're going to have a, a much larger data set that will include 29 different PFAS. But the comparison of signatures requires careful consideration of the analyte list. So this slide shows the same exact data set, but the evaluation looks really different based on the analyte selected. So if you look on the left, if we had just analyzed for PFOA and PFOS, you know, you could look at these two pie charts and think maybe it's a, it's a Teflon manufacturer because you're seeing a lot of PFOA. But if you look at the same two pie charts for the same two samples, but you know, looking at more analytes, you see something else completely different going on here. The signatures are very different. So make sure you understand the limitations of your signatures based on the analytes that your lab has reported. Okay, so I wanted to uh, present a case study today. And in this case study, we were tasked with a forensics evaluation of data generated from a landfill. And we were looking at groundwater and residential potable water samples. So 11 groundwater samples with concentrations greater than 100 parts per trillion total PFAS were selected for this evaluation. And I like to point out that sometimes it can become more challenging to do forensics on lower concentrations. So we selected 100 parts per trillion as our cutoff for this evaluation, and it was determined to be a good concentration for this site relative to total PFAS concentrations in other wells. The samples were analyzed for a list of 23 PFAS, and there were a few different objectives. So first, we wanted to differentiate on-site landfill sources versus off-site sources of PFAS. So when you're doing forensics, you know, it's important to understand that the patterns observed in groundwater, they could be representative of an old source, or they could be due to faint and transport properties of PFAS like we have just discussed. And you have to understand that even when the patterns of contamination between wells appear similar, it may not be conclusive to the source of PFAS because there could be something else going on related to freight and transport causing signatures to change. So our second objective was to determine if there was information on potential sources. So whether the source was a landfill mixture, an AFFF source, septic system, or something else. And our third objective was to identify hotspots or concentrated sources of PFAS within the landfill. And then finally, we were trying to identify whether or not we needed to gather additional information or maybe needed to install additional monitoring wells or sample existing wells in order to verify sources that are determined not to be associated with the landfill. So this pie charts revealed three different trends of PFAS contamination, and this is a busy slide, but I want to point out the three trends. So PFAS trend one, shaded blue. So this trend includes the sample closest to the landfill source at the edge of the landfill, and it extends to two wells down Greeny of the landfill to the north. 
PFAS trend two, which is shaded green, includes wells south of the landfill and some side gradient and down gradient wells. And PFAS trend three, shaded orange, includes two wells northwest of the landfill. So there was three different patterns of contamination that we identified as trend one, two, and three. And within each of these trends, um, we also identified some hot spots. So just so you can clearly see the different patterns of each trend, you can see the perfluorohexane sulfonic acid and PFOS start to increase on trend two, and trend three had the highest um, PFOS. So besides pie charts, we also looked at some diagnostic ratios. So first we looked at the perfluorocarboxylic acids, the re their relative abundance to total PFAS. And you can see here, what are some example perfluorocarboxylic acids? And these values should remain consistent within a PFAS plume that's associated with one source. Then we looked at the perfluorosulfonic acids relative abundance to total PFAS, and these values also should remain consistent within a PFAS plume that's associated with one source. Now values here greater than 0.5 may be a potential indication of a legacy AFFF source, so the one that's produced prior to 2002. We also looked at the perfluorocarboxylic acid to perfluorosulfonic acid ratio. So if the plumes associated with a unique source, these values should increase with the groundwater sample's distance from the source. Because remember that perfluorocarboxylic acids with similar fluorine chain lengths are more mobile than the perfluorosulfonic acids. So as this gets further away from the source, this value should increase. We looked at the PFOA to PFOS ratio. Here are values less than one, so when you have more PFOS than PFOA, may be an indication of a potential legacy AFFF source. Also, low PFOA to PFOS ratios could also be associated with septic leach fields. So we used the pie charts and we used the diagnostic ratios to help in our evaluation. So let's look at trend one again. So you can see the pattern from the well here um, that was located on the edge of the landfill towards the center of the landfill. And the signature down gradient of the north corner of the landfill is almost identical to the signature of the well on the edge of the landfill. So this well here on the edge of the landfill likely represents the landfill source and these down gradient wells likely represent the signature down gradient of this well. So the mixing of landfill leachate and groundwater is creating this consistent signature, which confirms that the plume from the landfill is moving offsite. Now, as expected with this trend, the perfluorocarboxylic acid to perfluorosulfonic acid ratio increases with distance down gradient from the landfill. And PFAS signatures like this that are rich in the perfluorocarboxylic acid, so the blue shades here on the pie chart, especially the shorter chain perfluorocarboxylic acids are an indication of a landfill source. In addition, you know, seeing the presence of PFOA at concentrations greater than PFOS, which is in red here, with the absence of fluorotelomers indicates this is probably unlikely an AFFF source. So that's trend one likely emanating from the landfill. So now let's look at trend two. So there are these two wells right here south of the landfill and concentrations at these two wells are lower by an order of magnitude than the concentrations at the side gradient wells. So because of this, the origin of this plume is probably up gradient to the north of these two wells, which are south of the landfill. So before we talk about the potential source of trend two, let's look at some ratios. So again, as expected, the perfluorocarboxylic acid to perfluorosulfonic acid ratio increases with distance down gradient from the well couplet, which was again, south of the landfill and closest to the source. So potential sources of this plume include the scale house septic system in the southern part of the landfill footprint. So just north of this well couplet. So former scale house areas were generally not well lined and many of them accumulated liquid waste for recycling or offsite disposal. And the liquid waste storage areas could be a source of PFAS from potentially 
high concentration PFAS solutions, including um, AFFF concentrate, alkaline cleaning fluids, and carpet treatment chemicals. So this was one area where we are recommending some future work to confirm the source. I think we may need to install a shallow well to determine if this uh, PFOS richer groundwater is associated with the landfill or another source, source such as the scale house area. Okay, so now let's look at trend three. So the pattern observed here was not a landfill source. Um, in most landfill groundwater, PFOS is a minor constituent since PFOS and other perfluorosulfonic acids would adsorb to the municipal solid waste in the soils more than PFOA and other perfluorocarbic silic acids. So if you remember from the slides with, uh, about sorption, the perfluorosulfonic acids have a higher tendency to bind to soil than the perfluorocarbic silic acids. And the perfluorocarbic silic acids are leaching away from the soil or municipal solid waste quicker than those perfluorosulfonic acids. So when higher concentrations of PFOS are detected, there's a higher likelihood of a different source. It could be a, maybe a liquid source, such as the use of AFFF. It could be a chemical poured into a septic system, could even be a, a composting facility. And potential PFAS sources to septic systems include both perfluorocarbic silic acids and perfluorosulfonic acids that could be found in carpets, carpet cleaning solutions, wash water from cleaning, water resistant or stain resistant clothing, and alkaline cleaning agents. Okay, so in the case of these wells, again, they were located northwest of the landfill, there's likely another upgradient source because the PFOS rich downgradient groundwater results are generally not associated with landfills. So here we need to do some research on potential upgradient sources and maybe install a new well, depending on what we find. So in all of these evaluations that I've shown you, we have to remember also that when there's a low organic composition in the source matrix and in the groundwater, the PFAS composition of a groundwater plume will generally reflect the PFAS source composition. So that's when there's a low organic composition. In addition, when there's a low organic composition, the longer chain PFAS may also be identified from these sources as those longer chain compounds are more mobile in matrices with lower organic compound, uh, lower organic content. But under organic rich site matrix conditions like a landfill, those perfluorosulfonic acid compounds may be selectively filtered out at a higher rate than the perfluorocarbic silic acids, resulting in more of a perfluorocarbic silic acid rich groundwater plume. So my final slide, my takeaway messages to th for today, um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna read the slide, but I think the major takeaway message is that PFAS forensics involves not only chemical signatures, but a really good understanding of the unique fate and transport properties of PFAS. And it's really important to also make sure you understand what analyte lists you're going to be including in your forensics evaluation. And with that, I'm now going to turn it over to Maureen Dooley of Regenesis. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. That was a really interesting and enlightening presentation that speaks to the complexity of the class of compounds and how important understanding the sources and the fate and transport of PFAS in the subsurface. And you know, some of the points that you made in your conclusion, um, I think are really important. And they're really important as it relates to even thinking about what the next phases are in remediation. And you know, it's the composition of the PFAS, you know, you know, what do you have, you know, what are you know, and also the complexity of the hydrogeological conditions and how important it is to understand that. So what I'm hoping to do in the next few minutes is to elaborate a little bit on data needs, you know, how it relates to remediation, specifically in situ remediation. And I think what I really want people to think about is, you know, what's the information you need for remediation design? You know, can this be incorporated as part of site characterization activities when data are be, being collected to gain an understanding of the PFAS fate and um, transport. So this next slide, I know this is a little bold, but you know, what if we could bring you a PFAS groundwater remediation solution that is proven much lower cost than pump and treat and guaranteed up to 30 years. Now I bring this up. This is a very complicated 
class of compounds and we have limited remedial options. And I think an ideal situation would be one where we can use in situ remediation to be able to mitigate these problems in a cost effective manner. And so I think, you know, the place to start with this is, you know, really what is our objective? You know, when we're looking at in situ remediation, we want to eliminate risk. So risk is the combination of hazard and exposure. If we are able to reduce exposure, we're going to reduce risk. Now, what we'll talk about is colloidal activated carbon, and we know that can, PFAS compounds can sorb to that, and Elizabeth, you know, just you know mentioned that in some of her investigations and how when you have additional organic matter you know certain classes of PFAS compounds will tend to get bound up in it so if you're able to engineer a system where you can bind this up change some of the mobility characteristics and reduce exposure you know this can be a feasible option you know for a risk management scenario and this approach is also really consistent when you think about natural attenuation. So what I want to refer to is a paper that Dr. Newell published recently on monitored natural attenuation. And he lays out some processes for doing site investigation and considering you know, natural attenuation as a program for PFAS impacted groundwater. But you know, just stepping back for a second, you know, what is natural attenuation? And you know, going back, you know, to what you know EPA defines this is, you know, this is an approach that relies on natural attenuation processes to achieve site-specific remedial objectives within the time frame that's reasonable. And there are a number of natural processes that include the reduction of mass, toxicity, mobility, volume, or concentration of contamination. So the processes that are typically associated with natural attenuation, the first one is transformation. Now with PFAS, what's interesting about this is, as Elizabeth discussed, with precursors, you can observe a lot of transformation, but that transformation may end up as you know, PFAS or you know, a compound like that. And so for natural attenuation and looking to reduce toxicity, um, degradation processes are not really something that's available, unfortunately, now. This is something that we would look at for chlorinated solvents or petroleum hydrocarbons. Um, a second process is reduction of contaminant concentrations. Quite often, this is achieved if you have source mitigation. So if you have source mitigation, then there is less contaminant getting into groundwater, and so that's not really what we're talking about here. So what I want to refer to is the reduction of contaminant mobility and bioavailability. So this is getting into enhanced sorption. If you have organic material, which we see in the natural pro in, in natural conditions, you may have some segment of the PFAS constituents tending to sorb. What we would what we're looking at is the application of colloidal activated carbon to enhance sorption and also change mobility and the transport properties of PFAS through groundwater and reducing mobility and reducing exposure. So just getting back to, you know, what is plume stop? It's a form of activated carbon. We mill this down to one to two microns. It is then suspended in a polymer, and that allows us to inject it into the saturated subsurface with low pressure and get this widespread distribution. Um, we've been involved with the colloidal carbon and plume stop for many, many years. Uh, commercial applications began in 2015, and actually our first application of plume stop to address PFAS contamination occurred in 2016. And over this time period, we certainly have gained a lot more understanding of how to use colloidal carbon and how best to apply it in the subsurface. Um, just you know, briefly, sites that we've been working on, uh, we have projects across, you know, really in the U.S. and across the world. We probably have over 26, 28 application, field applications to date. 
the types of sites that we're working on predominantly have been industrial manufacturing, um, airports, but we also have applications in DOD facilities, other bulk storage, and you know, super fun sites. But so, so what is this? You know, what's the process that takes place? So you have groundwater plume contamination is is moving through. Um, we will apply the colloidal carbon. It will take about 30 days to establish this barrier. And then some of these individual PFAS compounds will become sorbed to the colloidal carbon. So we're in essence creating this Brita filter. Um, I'm not gonna get into you know, tons and tons of detail based on time. At the end of the presentation, I do have a link to a video that gets into a lot more detail about almost the fate of the, the individual PFAS compounds within this barrier and then helps to explain why we are able to maintain and sustain um, long, the longevity and the longevity of the barrier that may you know, lead into decades of treatment and our ability to keep groundwater concentrations, PFAS concentrations below target levels for an expended, extended period of time. You know, so the mode of action here is ad adsorption. So as groundwater moves through, you know, moves through, the PFAS compounds are sorbed. Um, what's you know what we're at, in essence doing is we're changing the FOC of the subsurface, and if we think of this in terms of retardation factors, um, PFAS will have a retardation factor naturally in a range of in the individual compounds of three to twenty, meaning that will travel anywhere from three to twenty times, you know, slower than groundwater flow rates. After the application of the colloidal carbon, your retardation factors may increase to something as large as 10,000, which means the travel or transport is 10,000 times slower than natural groundwater flow rates. So that means we are able to sequester these compounds for an extended period of time. So, you know, you know how does this look when you're, you know, scoping out something at full scale. Example, if you have, you know, say an airport site, you have fire training area, and you need to cut off a plume before it migrates to some, you know, sensitive receptors, you know, you can create, inject the material and create this barrier. But this is a nice conceptual picture. It looks really pretty. It's a cartoon. You know, what is the data that we really need and we really need to understand? We need to understand groundwater flow. We need to understand flux. We need to understand contaminant concentrations. And I think really interesting point and an important point that Elizabeth brought up with a top analysis, you know, if things are transforming, if some of these precursors are transforming, you know, what's our maximum load of, you know, PFOS going to be? And I think that's important and just, important information to understand and also very critically what is the distribution you know we may look at a well screen and this um, you know 10 20 foot thickness but there's a lot of heterogeneity and a lot of flux and micro flux zones and the better understanding we have of these components I think the better you know the better design we can provide so what are our considerations you know, one, what are the types of PFAS components present? You know, what are our targets? You know, what are the um, regulatory standards, longer chain versus shorter chain? Uh, what's our groundwater flux? That's really, really important. And contaminant concentrations, both target and non-target compounds. And are we able to apply this material to get the distribution that's required? In the picture to the right, we can see a soil boring. You know, this black color is the colloidal carbon. We really need this consistent distribution through the subsurface to be able to create this barrier and, and not have any holes and get that net when we're looking to achieve standards that are in the part per trillion. So we have a process that we will go through where we want to conduct some design verification testing. We also look at flux in using passive flux meters. Taking that data, we're going to put together a design. That design will also incorporate us running models, looking at competitive absorption, back diffusion. And we will um, often 
you know, want to do some sort of injection verification, you know, can we get the ROIs that we need? And then based on that, we can put together a, a full design and allow to provide estimates on what the longevity of a barrier is. So this design verification, we're looking at subsurface investigation specific to the application. And this is really not anything that's out of the ordinary. We're looking at detailed, you know, boring logs. We want to understand flow rates. Maybe it's a, you know, an injection test that takes a day or two. Um, you know, the incorporation of passive flux meters, but also high resolution sensing tools. So these are a lot of tools that are used in these initial investigations. And I think, you know, thinking forward, you know, are we getting the information we need for remediation? Because if we're looking for just plume characterization, it may not include what we need for remediation design. Um, our flux tracer tool is our passive flux meter. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time. You can go to our website on this, but basically this is a pre-assembled device that you can, you can place in an existing well put it there for two weeks, retrieve it. This is something that consultants, you guys do this yourselves. Um, you send, you send these, this device back to us and we can do analysis to look at, you know, in one foot sections, you know, what the flow, you know, what look at calculating Darcy flux, mass flux in groundwater, which is extremely useful in our designs. You know, ultimately we want to, we want to um, have this data available so we can get results that show rapid reduction, sustained treatment, you know, have a program that doesn't require O&M, no waste generated, sustainable and low cost. This, this figure shows the results from our first test, uh, our first application of, of Plume Stop for PFAS that was in Ontario and we're, you know, at six years right now and we've still been able to maintain the targets. The um, the other important thing I want to bring out, a lot of times people talk about longevity. And with Regenesis, if we go through this process of evaluating a site, you know, running a DVT, doing the flux tracers, you know, going through this commissioning phase and confirming feasibility, you know, we are we are going to warranty our barriers for a standard 10 years and up to 30 years. So we have confidence that, you know, we under, we have a good understanding of the capability of the colloidal carbon. And if, you know, we have, you know, we look at the site, site details, th this is certainly something that is going to be standard for us in moving forward with some of these uh, plume stop PFAS applications. So really in summary, at Regenesis, we have a suite of remediation technologies. Um, the colloidal carbon is something that you know can be used and is being used to address and reduce the risk of PFAS in groundwater. Data collection, data need, data is really, really important, and our design verification is an important stage for us to really understand your site um, to develop these cost-effective strategies. Um, so with that. Um, again, I want to thank Elizabeth for a really, really great presentation. I really learned a lot and i um, happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you very much, Maureen. That does conclude the formal section of our presentation. So at this point, we'd like to shift into the question and answer portion of the webcast. Before we do this, just a couple quick reminders. First, we will be sending out a brief survey after the webinar. We really appreciate your feedback. So please take a minute to let us know how we did. Also, you'll receive an email with the recording as soon as it is available. All right, so let's circle back to the questions here. Uh, this first question is for Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, the question is, you mentioned the presence of particulates in aqueous samples can affect the chemical signatures. Is there a way, I'm sorry, is there a recommendation as to what our labs should be doing when they receive aqueous samples with particulates? Yeah, thank you, good question. So. Right now, um, most, not all labs, are centrifuging the samples, separating out the particulates, and decanting the aqueous fraction, and then doing an extraction and an analysis on that aqueous fraction. 
Some labs are performing a separate extraction on the particulate phase also, and then combining the aqueous and particulate extractions to get a, more of a total result. So there's no consistency. And even then, I just want to point out, even the new EPA method 1633 doesn't address this inconsistency yet. So laboratories, if they're not including the extraction of the particulates and they're only extracting the water phase, are not giving you a total uh, PFAS measurement of the aqueous samples. And that may be okay, in certain instances, depending on your ultimate project objectives. So as I mentioned, you know, the PFAS can partition to the solids, especially the longer chain PFAS. And when those solids settle out or they're removed from the water samples, the concentrations in the sample can be lower by over an order of magnitude or more if the solids than if the solids were included in the sample. And as I mentioned, the chemical fingerprint can also differ. So whether or not you really want the particulates to be included, again, depends on your objective. It may be appropriate to do both to see what the difference is. For forensics, I would suggest including the particulates. And the answer may be different if you're doing a remedial action, you know, a human or ecological risk assessment. I would always recommend working with your risk assessor. Surface water or ground or wastewater may need to include particulates for compliance and permit permitting purposes. And also, I you know, also be careful of your sampling methods. Try to minimize the presence of particulates. Um, in, your, in, the, in the methods that you're using for sampling. Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. So next question is from Maureen. Maureen, the question is, does the application of plume stop change groundwater flow rates? Oh, oh thanks, Dean. That's, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, it does not. So the way the, the plume stop or colloidal carbon works is, you know, we, we do apply this and it's, you know, going to be distributed, but, one of the one of the interesting characteristics is that it's going to coat the soil particles and because of a charge and some things like that it's going to continue to move and it doesn't agglomerate so at the end of the day what happens is we do not have any change to hydraulic conductivity okay thank you maureen so this next question here is for elizabeth and elizabeth the question is are there any ancillary analyses that should be performed with the regular PFAS analysis for the forensics evaluation? Uh, yes, definitely. So when you're collecting aqueous samples in the field, especially uh, surface water, groundwater, make sure, first of all, that you're measuring turbidity. And it may also be helpful to submit samples to the lab for total suspended solids analysis. It's not expensive and, and it can help you interpret the results you do get. Another thing, it may be helpful to know if you have an organic rich matrix or not. Because remember, if you do have an organic rich matrix, some of those PFAS, like the perfluorosulfonic acids, like PFOS, could be selectively filtered out at a higher rate than things like P4, because they'll get absorbed to the organic material. Um, so adding, you know, it'd be helpful to add a TOC analysis as well. And adding analyses like total suspended solids, total organic carbon are low cost, easy to do. Analyses like top assay that I went over can definitely also be useful in circumstance, circumstances to understand PFAS transformation. Uh, th those have to be used, um, you know, judiciously because they are definitely going to add more significant costs to your investigation. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. So uh, we have another question for Maureen here. And um, Maureen, the question is, will more than one application of plume stop be required for a barrier to last 10 to 30 years? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think probably the the question we get the most is related to longevity and, you know, because there's, you know, one, a fixed amount of carbon there and a fixed amount of sorption sites, um, you know, well, how does this affect longevity? Do you have to, you know, reapply? At first, everything is going to be, you know, specific to an individual site. But I think to answer this, you know, a little bit generally, so the plume stop, you know, doesn't sequester the PFAS indefinitely, but rather the, the plume stop changes the transport characteristics. So when we apply the colloidal carbon, we're going to paint you know, we're going to basically paint the subsurface and create this coating. And that changes the FOC, as we've talked about, retardation factors in this transport. But what we found, and also with third-party um, 
evaluations is that we can have, you know, it can take decades for the PFAS to move across the barrier. And also keep in mind how it sorbs is not how it desorbs. So it's, it's not coming through as a front. And I think that's where I have this referral to a video that's on this QR code on this video. That's going to give, I think, a little bit more detailed um, information and in how this transports. But, you know, there, at the end of the day, we are able to design barriers with a single application that can be maintained for 10 to 30 years and even longer. But what is going to drive this and drive the feasibility of this is obviously going to be our flux, our contaminant concentrations. Um, and so for us to have a really good understanding of what's at the site, you know, what do we have coming into it? And I think then the other component of this is, is there, a, is there a consistent source and is there any source mitigation? Because that will also um, be an important part to that in the longevity of the barrier. But what we'll do is we'll look at every site individually and we can discuss that. But we certainly have designed and can design sites for just single applications. All right, thanks Maureen. Um, we have another question here for Elizabeth, and Elizabeth, the question is, have you been able to determine unique signatures of other sources besides AFFF? Huh, yes. Uh, actually, we're working uh, with the municipality right now who recently started detecting PFAS above their state's uh, MCL in one of the town's wells. And the compound that was most prevalent was PFNA, so perfluoronanoic acid. So we started, we did this focused desktop study first to determine uh, the source of the PFNA, focusing on the homes, the new football field installed, schools in the area of the well. We looked at janitorial practices, chemicals used. I can tell you safety data sheets on cleaning products provided little to no information. Um, and we suspected that what it came down to had to do with the washing of the carpeting in the schools with the wash water that's getting sent down the drain. So we did a little experiment. We had one of the schools uh, clean the carpets one day and we sent a sample of the wash water and the cleaning product off for PFAS analysis. And the cleaning product sample unfortunately exhibited a lot of um, matrix issues and we didn't really get good results from it. But the wash water was clear, you know, that the PFNA was coming most likely from the stain treated carpeting. And PFNA is known to be associated with carpeting um, and stain resistant materials. So at this point, we're actually, you know, we're gonna stop the source. We're gonna have the school start containerizing their wash water, sending it out for disposal. We're gonna set up a temporary treatment system at the wellhead to eventually flush out that PFNA from the well. So it's an interesting project. That's an interesting source. I mean, it, it, you never know where yeah. you're gonna find it, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, so we have time for, I think, one, maybe one more question here. Um, Maureen, this is a question for you. It is, um, have any PFAS sites been closed after a plume stop application? Oh, yeah, um, yeah. So looking at our site, actually our first site that was up in, in Canada from 2016, the monitoring that we're doing now is really just for academic purposes. So that, you know, we had a regulatory resolution and, and so that's been, you know, so that's not being sampled anymore. You know, it's only because we're, we're just wanting to track the data over the long term. Um, we also have received our certificate of completion for programs that were used in Brownfield program um, where there was PFAS contamination. So we've, we've also achieved that sort of certification or closure. All right, thank you very much, Maureen. That is going to be the end of our chat questions. If we did not get to your question, someone will make an effort to follow up with you. If you'd like to learn more about services from TRC, you can visit trccompanies.com. If you'd like to learn more about remediation solutions from Regenesis, please visit regenesis.com. Thanks again very much to Elizabeth Denley and Maureen Dooley, and thanks to everyone who could join us. Have a great day.